lasers. We've all seen them, we've all used them. But how do they actually work? So in order to explain lasers, I think it's best to explain what the term actually means. So laser is an acronym for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. And this naturally begs the question, what is stimulated emission of radiation? So let's start with an atom. And this atom has two discrete energy levels. And in this example, the ground level, which we denote as one, is populated by an electron. Now this electron can actually transition between these discrete energy states when it absorbs energy either from incoming light, photons, or heat, phonons. So this is possibility number one, absorption. Now it's really important to keep in mind that transitions are only allowed between discrete energy levels, such as the two shown above. And this leads to emission lines and absorption lines, which are specific for every element. You may have heard of the Fraunhofer absorption lines. So when an electron is excited from a lower to a higher energy level, it's unlikely for it to stay in that higher level forever. This excited electron can decay back to its ground state without external influence and emit a photon with a wavelength equal to the energy difference between the states, which we call delta E. Now this is called spontaneous emission. This is the second possibility. The phase and direction associated with the photon that is emitted is completely random. And this is basically how fluorescence and uh, thermal emission of light work. So in contrast, the Gegenspieler of spontaneous emission is stimulated emission. In stimulated emission, an incoming photon of a specific frequency, which corresponds to the energy difference between the two states, can interact with an excited atomic electron, causing it to drop down to a lower energy level. And the energy that's set free transfers to the electromagnetic field creating a new coherent photon with a frequency, polarization, and direction of travel that are all identical to the photon of the incident wave. So this is a photon that's coherent with the incoming photon. So in the simplest terms, this is basically what a laser is. Light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. The third process, stimulated emission, is the dominant one in the material. In plain English, we're basically creating a light avalanche of monochromatic coherent light. So let's start by putting this into math terms. The first person to work this out was Albert Einstein, who described these three processes with the so-called Einstein coefficients. Now the Einstein coefficients measure the probabilities of a particular process occurring. Important now is that next to the energy levels, we're also looking at the population N1 and N2. Spontaneous emission can be described as A21, and we don't need to look at this further. We can describe absorption and stimulated emission using B12 and B21 respectively. The Bs are both equal to their respective population N, so the number of electrons at a certain energy level, times their atomic transition probability W. So this transition probability is derived from Fermi's golden rule. Now I don't want to get into these specifics too much, but Fermi's golden rule is basically a formula that describes the transition rates so the probability of a transition per unit time from one energy eigenstate to another energy eigenstate. And this is the result usually of a weak perturbation. It has a couple of properties. And the most important part here is that W is proportional to the square of the perturbation matrix element H. And this is super important. H is a Hermitian operator, which means that the absolute value of HKM and HMK is the same. This has very big implications. This means that the probabilities of absorption and stimulated emission are actually the same. So if we know the probabilities for both these processes are identical, how can we achieve this amplification, right? So in order to make a laser work, we must have a way of making stimulated emission the dominant process in the material. Now it turns out because chance in theory for either reaction to take place is identical, we only need more electrons in the excited state for stimulated emission to occur as the dominant process. So we needed a majority of our electrons to be in a higher excited state N2 with respect to the ground state N1. And this condition is called population inversion. So how do we achieve a population inversion with a two-level system? 
Spoiler alert, the answer is it's impossible. So let me explain. We can never reach a population inversion in a two-level laser system because the light that we use to pump has the same wavelength as the light that's emitted during stimulated emission. So even if we pump a ton of energy into the system and excite many electrons to the higher energy state, as more and more electrons move into that state and uh, depopulate the ground state, remember, because the, the incoming and emitted light has the same wavelength and the transition probabilities are also the same, it's going to become more and more difficult to excite only ground state electrons, statistically speaking, right? Because the more electrons are excited, the less remain in the ground state they can actually be excited. And so when this happens, the probability that we actually de-excite the higher energy electrons with our pump light by means of stimulated emission rises tremendously. The best outcome we can achieve is basically a 50-50 split in a two-level system. This is the, the equilibrium value. So the solution to this dilemma is to use a three-level system. In a three-level system, we have a material that has a ground state, which we can pump to the higher excited state three. The trick is that this higher state rapidly relaxes to a slightly lower energy state two. And this relaxation usually happens without radiation, but from things like shocks at the glass or phonons or something. So state two is more stable and lives for a much longer time. This now allows for a laser transition from state number two to state number one. So the laser light and the pump light now have different wavelengths. And so we circumvent this two-level problem with the equilibrium because electrons are excited to three, quickly de-excite to level two. So they depopulate level three. And uh, like by this, I mean, there's just like not many electrons left in level three at any time relative to level one. So if we just pump in enough energy to the material, we will basically always excite electrons from one to level three, so this 50-50 problem never happens between levels one and three. And this now allows us to achieve the population inversion that we require from level two with regards to level one. And now we have a laser. So the only downside of this three level system is that we need a lot of energy to get all the electrons from level one to level three. This of course sucks. So what do we do? Fairly simple, we just add another energy level to make it a four level system. In a four level laser crystal, we now use pump light to excite the electrons from the ground state one to the highest state four. Now state four electrons rapidly de-excite to state three, which again is metastable and has a longer lifetime. The laser transition is now from state three to state two. And here's a trick, right? State two is super short lived. So even when any given electron de-excites to two, the electron in two almost immediately de-excites further to the ground state one. So state two is left virtually empty, even in pumped operation. You see, the whole thing is now, relatively to two, three will basically always, always have a population inversion. And this can now be achieved by just even exciting a few electrons from the ground state to level four. And so this makes the four level system much, much more efficient. So that's it. I hope you found this video informative and feel free to like and subscribe. See you in the next video.